Hey everyone, welcome back to the Art to Life podcast. Uh, really, really excited today to share with you my next guest, uh, David Deshaman. He is a uh, incredible, incredible, underline, incredible uh, humanitarian uh, assignment photographer. His work's just phenomenal. Uh, best-selling author, podcaster, and um, workshop leader. He's a world explorer, adventurer, and for so many people, I think serves as like a high mountain guide for um, for the creative process, you know, in life and art. And I, uh, there's so many fronts that I relate to, so many aspects of, of how he's living, what he's doing, that I resonate with. Um, it was really hard to narrow down uh, what I want to talk to David about. But I'm going to start today. First of all, David, thank you for being here. He's in Canada, by the way. Um, David, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you. What a privilege. Yeah. So, um, and you're on Vancouver Island, correct? I sure Still? am. Yep. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> it's interesting because I've been making art my whole life and it's a fairly solitary practice and but the two things that I love the most in my life uh, that is, is this art making thing that's fairly sedentary and contemplative. And it's also going out in the world and, and having adventures. And so you can see where when I came across your work, uh, I was just so drawn to it and, and just your whole approach to creativity. On your website, uh, I love this Helen Keller quote, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. And, uh, you know, I've had a little challenge putting these, this creativity and adventure. I do these destination workshops where, you know, we're going to these exotic places, but could you just speak a little bit about how you pair those up, the, the relationship between creativity and adventure? I think it's all the same thing. I think it's all about exploration and discovery. You know, Picasso was asked if he knew what his paintings were going to look like before he painted them. And he said, of course not. If I knew that, I why, why would I even paint them? You know, we this is adventure, creativity. It's all it's all part of the same thing. You know, some we like to think, especially as artists, we like to think of creativity as as being the sole domain of the artist. But in reality, it's it's the domain of anyone that needs to approach a problem somewhat obliquely, look, look at it from a different angle, figure something out. Cause you know, like the story of my life is, well, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> and, uh, right. and, and isn't that true of every creative, whether, you know, whether you're putting paint to canvas or photographing or writing. Um, and in the same way, when you're going out and having an adventure, uh, it's not an adventure if you're just beating the same path that everyone else has beaten before you. Uh, and it, the same is true of the arts. You know, it, it, it's if you're doing paint by numbers, I'm not sure you got a claim on creativity. You know, like that's that, that's certainly we're not we're not talking art when you're uh, when you're doing paint by numbers. And the same thing with adventure. You know, if you just it, it's we often say it's only adventure when something goes wrong. And and I sort of think that way about creative stuff. You know, it's it, that's when something goes wrong. That's the vector. That's the point at which you kind of take a path, and it's unknown. And you're like, well, let's see what happens. And and so that's where I think understanding the creative process, having the freedom to explore these things, and not being held back by rules and scripts that you haven't signed off on. I think those are really important. I don't know. Like, is that a life skill? I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's letting go of uncertainty, learning how to let go of that, kind of allowing, remembering that those trips, and when I'm thinking back on places I've been, the, you know, the buses that didn't make it to the destination and where you ended up staying and all the amazing experiences usually occurred, um, they were not planned and they were heading in 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 scary territory you know and yeah but but how do we as artists or creatives or just as normal people um you know i i know so many people and i know i come in contact with so many kinds of people artists and and, and just normal muggle type people and 
There is a tendency to minimize risk. We, we have this, you know, I see that as almost, maybe it's just part of our operating system. We just kind of want to make sure things stay the same. Certainty is, is valued, <laughs> you know, but do you think that this, this sort of appetite for risk is, is a learned thing? And, and maybe art making is the process of learning that, but you know, you know what I mean? Like you have this, but what about regular folks? I mean, others, do you, do you feel like this is something that we just get better and better at the more we see the payoffs? Uh, maybe. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I like the implication that I'm not a regular person, but yeah, I no, we, the more you discover that you are resilient the more you are willing to kind of take a next step into the unknown, the more times you've walked around in the dark and not been injured, not been, you know, uh, sidelined, the more willing you are to be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's see where this curiosity leads me. I, I don't think it's a, a superhuman trait. I don't think it's something that some people have and others don't. In fact, mm -hmm. I would I would argue that this is one of the benefits of art making is that it makes us, if we allow it, to do so, it makes us um, a little bit more, a little bit more friendly with uncertainty because we know that we're resilient. And you know, especially in the in the world of art making, you know, yeah, we we have a firmware issue because evolution has taught us all through millions of years to fear certain things and to be very wary of risk. And and that's that's important when you're being you know potentially chased by a lion on the savanna. Not a lot of people you know get yeah. truly <laughs> eviscerated by an art critic, right? Like truly, it's all words. It's you, no one is actually going to die if you know uh, you are not going to die if someone doesn't like your most recent series of of paintings or your most recent body of work or your book or you know we're so if we can let go of some of that ego and just go you know what if it's crap I will discover that and I will bounce back and on top of that here's the benefit no one ever learns anything from success it's always failure that's our best teacher and it's not going to kill you it's I mean I've been there I've been through divorces I've been through a bankruptcy uh, I've, I've, as you and I were talking about earlier, I just, six weeks ago, I had my, my leg amputated. These are generally speaking, these are scary things. You want to know what blows my mind even more, Nick, above all of this stuff, people are still more scared of speaking in public. Like yes. <laughs> if, if, if that doesn't tell you, we need a firmware upgrade where risk is concerned on stuff that it's not going to kill you. It's not even, yeah. it might make you a little dizzy and nauseous, but that's it. Yeah. I sometimes think it's, it, it's the, it's the fear of the thing when the actual thing is happening. You know, when you were, we were talking earlier about, you know, you, this amputation, like that's, that's a pretty terrifying word. And just, you, you know, it's like, I had this and I'm actually like excited about what's coming for me and it's going to give you all this freedom and, you know, but I sometimes think where I feel ang anxious is, is in the fear of the idea of the thing before the actual things happen. Standing up in front and talking to people when you're doing it is actually kind of fun, but the thought of doing it, do you know what I mean? It's kind of, yeah, for some people, you know, I, I love it. I, but I'm as I get older, I'm kind of be. I'm not sure whether I'm more of a stoic or more of a Zen kind of guy. But you know, there's this idea of suffering twice. We worry about something, and the <laughs> yeah. worry itself is so hard, and and it drains us of our creative and our mental resources. And and then we experience the thing again, and the thing that we're afraid of, you know, in our and so it's uh, you know, there's sort of a, a Zen notion that that's the second arrow. Why 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 injure yourself twice? Why allow yourself to suffer twice? I think fear, once you get comfortable with the reality that truly, until that final thing that takes you out, takes you out, what doesn't kill you gives you something to blog about. It gives you, you know, a story. It makes you, it takes you into deeper complexity. It pushes the evolution of your character and your creativity. There's not a lot that's truly 
in our lives, there's not a lot that's truly, truly on, on a day-to-day basis frightening. We're not facing genocide. Most of us have got food on the table. Mm-hmm. You know, as it, when it gets right down to it, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not facing day-to-day issues that are truly deserving mm-hmm. of your terror. Um, in light of that, you know what? Taking a risk on that haiku that you've been working on or whatever, you know, it's, I mean, if you don't get me wrong, I know we feel it. We feel it so deeply because we're exposing yeah. a piece of ourselves. But that again, you know, when, when you go through it enough times that you realize the, the rewards, the pieces of writing that I've, that I've done, Nick, that are the most vulnerable, that I am the most nervous of hitting the send button on are always the ones that get the most response. And I think it's because people, other people, not that we write necessarily or create our art for other people, but they do respond. They resonate with vulnerability and God help me, you know, with, with authenticity, it's such a catch word. I'm not sure it means anything anymore, but, but true, the true courage to be yourself my God, it's so rare that when we see it, we're just like, oh, thank God someone, you know, and maybe that's that's the great gift of creativity is it reminds us all that we're not alone. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I know that one of the breakthroughs for me was uh, with, with my art making anyway, was I realized how much pre-work I was doing, you know, this, this traumatizing myself before I even got into the studio. And I change the way I work. I, I do not think about it. I don't plan it anymore. I, I have a whole thing where I just show up. And then as soon as I, then I don't think about it at all until I start mark making. And then, then I'm in it. And that's a different experience. That's actually really enjoyable. And the work got better. The work's been, it's more, more fun. It's easier to go to the studio. You know, it's just interesting, like how much energy I was spending worrying about if I was going to pull this off, did it look like the work I was making pri- previously, you know? Just, so I love this just unfolding um, kind of process that you're talking about. It's really, uh, it's really the, the key. And I'm curious in your, exp- like, what have been for you some of the truly frightening or scary moments? I mean, when you were describing, and I was thinking of a, I tried to pave a road myself with a actual, one of those giant machines that flattened the pavement out, like the tar. I thought I thought I would save money and do this myself. And I, I literally <laughs> didn't know how to operate it. And I almost drove it off the side. And these are several tons, you know, and, it, and I stopped the machine just in time before this me and it went over the side. And I was so scared because I saw my, I mean, I almost killed myself and, you know, but that's like the only time, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know of any other times where I almost like fearing for my life, you know, and that was like 30 years ago, but are, do you, you've been out in the world and you've been doing, I mean, you photograph all these, you know, you're in undersea with whales and sharks. And I mean, have you, what, I'm just curious, like, what are some of the times where you've been really, really scared for your life? You know, it's it's funny that they're, they're not the, you know, when I first started uh, doing the humanitarian photography, which I, I don't do as much anymore, I'm doing more conservation stuff. And, but, you know, I was going to places like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Haiti oh. and, you know, places, places with a legitimate um, risk of being killed or more likely kidnapped and then killed. Um and and everyone was always like, oh, look, you know, I remember my father uh, reminding me, you know, he said, life is cheap in some of these places. And and what I've learned is that everything is OK. And I know this isn't quite the answer to your question, but I've learned that everything's always OK until it's not. And you go to these places and everything is OK. And in my situation, I never had any, you know, I didn't have an incident with a child soldier with a gun or someone with an itchy trigger mm-hmm. finger. Like I never mm-hmm. had that, you know, my, my big thing came in Tuscany when I fell off this wall and had this accident that led to the amputation. Um, nobody ever warned me about Tuscany, by the way, it was always Haiti or Congo. And no one ever <laughs> yeah, said, look right. out for Tuscany. Um, 
but but it, it legitimately the stuff that actually has scared me is being sick in some of these places. I had a kidney stone in uh, mm. Varanasi, India, and I, I generally just feel safe, kind of no matter where I am. But yeah. the minute I get sick, like legitimately, I was I was pretty nervous. And this, we finally found this doctor, and he came in. And he confirmed that it was a kidney stone. And he just oh. said, and he gave me like this vial of something. I don't know what. It was a glass vial, one of those old ampule ones where you, you crack the glass and a, and a syringe. And he says, if it, the pain gets too bad, use this. And that was all he said. There was no instruction. There was like, I don't know how to use, like, I've never, you know, shot morphine. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and that was, you know, stuff like that. The other stuff, you know, bears and sharks, and I've had a, I've had a, and I had one encounter with sharks where they were a little too curious for my liking, and I had to kind of bounce them off my camera dome um, a few times. But for the most part, that's not where that's not where the fear yeah. comes in. And when it does, it's legitimate fear. Like that's the stuff that that will, yeah. you know, rolling rolling yourself uh, with a steamroller. That, that, that's a that's a legit fear. And I've I've had four by four experiences that uh, they had a pretty strong pucker factor. And I, I'd much rather hang out, you know, and be five feet from a grizzly bear than uh, than relive some of those, um, yeah, you know, being crushed inside my my Toyota Tacoma is not really the way I want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. When uh, when you had that kidney stone, where you were shooting Varanasi in India? Varanasi, yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the banks yeah. of the on the banks of the Ganges. Yeah, I was I, I love that town. I mean, I, I was the last time was uh, I was there for three weeks, just walking up and down and photographing, yeah. and yeah, pretty pretty fantastic. It's I, I've been there, and it's it completely. Um, I'll never forget it. It was just amazing. And when I saw the photographs of it, I knew right away uh, on your site, you know. Um, but you know, I I want to dive into your photographs a little because <clears throat> there's something about how you're shooting that I find just, it's kind of remarkable. And, and I was trying to think what it is, but when we see a photograph of something, whether it's a whale or a person or whatever, we can experience it as that thing. But then a really powerful photograph kind of is speaking to something so much bigger than the subject and you know more the humanity of of what you're photographing and you you and i'm just curious i know you know this because your work this is what all your work is doing and even if it's just like photographs of whales there's it's a bigger photograph it references more does this make sense to you and or and does it does how do you are how do you articulate this 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 come from that you're shooting with that makes the work the way it is. Does does that make sense? It's it's yeah no it's very big. much does. It's big it, work, it, you know. It's uh, I, so first of all, just sort of theoretically, I try very hard, and when I teach, this is sort of a central kind of thing on which I, I speak, and that is, you know, making a photograph. Uh, you can photograph. There there are photographs that are of something, which is mm. the subject matter. And then there are photographs that are about something. And I would argue that's what a true subject is, a theme, an idea, an emotion. And, and I would imagine that's sort of the same with any of the arts in some way. Is And I'm very concerned about what my photographs, of course, what they're of. Uh, that's where my curiosity goes. And I, I, there are a lot of things I don't photograph because I'm not interested in those kind of subject matters. But I'm very conscious of what my photographs are about for me. And usually the words that uh, are closest to me are um, intimate uh, encounters. I I don't want to photograph a whale. I want to photograph an encounter with a whale. I, I want to photograph how that, you know, there's a, a almost a cliche in photography. You don't shoot what it looks like, shoot how it feels. Uh, it's not such a cliche that people actually do it a lot, <laughs> but yeah, um, but it's yeah. a, it's a great idea. And here's the other idea that I that I teach about is that photographs can be visual, but I think they can be more than that. They can be visceral, and I'm always trying to get to mm. the visceral. I'm always trying to get to the thing that first of all makes me kind of my heart speed up, makes me smile, make gives me joy, 
And usually that's getting closer, having a true encounter, spending a long time with either the people I'm working with or the, you know, the species, the, the cultures, whatever it is I'm, I'm photographing. And that gives me that you can't, because you can't photograph something deeply if you haven't experienced it deeply. And, and to the depth that you experience it, I think you can also, you have an opportunity to photograph it and it's showing up in the eventual photographs. So that's what I'm chasing. So it, it thrills me that you see that. It thrills me that, you know, that you feel that because at the end of the day, I want, I want someone to encounter my photograph and feel something that, you know, rather than just go, oh, that's what a grizzly bear looks like. I'm not interested in creating documents of record. I want something, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just not what I do. I want something where you look at and just go, oh, man, and feel the wonder and the awe. We have too yeah. little awe in our lives. Yes. And uh, and it's diminishing. You know, I do have, there's a con conservation approach, you know, that I truly believe that we will, I hope some of us will protect what we love. And and we need that more than ever, you know, um, diminishing habitat and global warming and all of these issues that are making, I, hey, we're all, we are all animals and we're all on the same planet. And, uh, and I think we're in danger of, of truly, truly irrevocably screwing that up for them and for, for us. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of a, in the background, one of my motivators is the hope that maybe this will nudge some change. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm an art, I'm a painter mostly. And, and the come from that you're talking about, what you're after is um, very similar. I mean, it affects, it affects the photography, obviously, because you're looking for a story, but it's, there's all the world is out there. You're photographing whales and everything and things that are real, but this also relates to when you're, you're making your art. And this is what's been so interesting for me in my growth is knowing how important it is, where the come from is, how I'm thinking, and then doing my art, like producing the thing. It, it might look like colorful scratches and abstract thing, but the fact is because of the feeling that I'm trying to imbue in it, the orientation I have, the, the, and that ends up becoming part of it. But so I know that, and I can look at artwork, but when I saw your, especially your undersea work, you know, the whales and things that are normally photographed, like, wow, look at that grizzly bear, isn't that amazing? But it, it had the same feeling as the Varanasi pictures, as the, they're like documentary or, I, you know, I don't know, I'm looking at this whale photograph right here of, of the diver, you know, uh, that um, just the storytelling and, and the, I don't know, there's just a poignancy about them that is, that is so usually not seen in wilderness, in wildlife photography. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's just a kind of a, um, it's, it's surprising and almost like we would find these in a museum about, about the plight of the natural world, you know, a show about that. And maybe that's what you're doing and that's why they have that feeling, but it was, it's really, um, it's different, you know, and, and it's really beautiful. I'm just Thank curious, you. does, does that, do, do, you know what I mean? If you see that those ideas that you're sharing, that translates to any kind of art making, which I think is so interesting, this orientation, this come from. Yeah, I, I, I'm very concerned about for myself, because life is short and we only have so much time, about having the richest experiences. And, and by that, I don't mean, you know, going out first class travel and whatever. That's neither here nor there. But but richness of emotion and uh, like truly experiencing something. And, and I think when you can, when that can align with the things that you're most interested in, most passionate about, and you have those experiences, assuming you also have the craft to pull it off, uh, you know, you also have to be a technician and, and be capable with your tools. Um, but I, I, I look at my tools, not 
I mean, they, yes, of course it's the camera, but it, the tools for a photographer are the same kind of tools that you have. They're line and shape and color. And, and I, I just so badly want to have those experiences themselves for the pure sake of having those experiences. And I can't help but think if the experiences are that rich, that, that, if I'm paying attention, if I'm being mindful and in intentional, that they will come through in what I in what I create. Uh, but the focus has to be first on the experience, not on the hope. Just like you said, you know, you, you don't do a lot of pre thinking. You go to the studio, you show up. I show up, and the first thing I need to do is show up to an experience mm -hmm. and see see where that leads me you know you don't wait till you're inspired you don't wait until you know you feel good enough you just show up and you do the work and in my case you press the shutter a lot of times you try different approaches all in the hopes of not I'm not working to get a good photograph I'm I'm working to I don't know. I, I have a hard yeah. time putting it into words, which, you know, is probably why I, I uh, as much as I am a writer, also a photographer, because when it gets hard to put into words, I pick up the camera and I, you know, I use that. But I'm looking for I'm looking for elegance of of line and shape. I'm looking for interesting juxtapositions where color, you know, I, I use my uh, where color is being used. I, I'm trying to be sensitive to what the color does for us emotionally and how it works together. So, um, but yeah, that that idea of where you are coming from and and the look, <laughs> the art is only as good as the artist, you know. And so, if you have a rich inner life, if you are, if you have something to say. I think with the right amount of practice of your craft, it will come through. And as you said, be in, you know, be imbued in in what you're creating. On the good days, on the bad days, not so much. But you know, that's where we learn and we try again, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's, and I know you teach photography, and you have all kinds of classes, and um, but just the classical uh, kind of academic use of differences in your work. Um, I just love, you know, these, the, the contrasts of things. I, I teach in how I approach art and how I teach people and help them with their work is, is, is understanding the compilation of differences, how one thing comes and meets another and the tension that that creates. And, and I just, <clears throat> when I look at your work and I see what you're doing and how you're storytelling with this, but do you think of of the sort of design aspect of it or the poignancy of of these compositions and arrangement of dark and light patterns that you're doing that are also realism? <laughs> you know, it's also of a thing. Do you think of it that way? Do you break 100%. it down that way? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I and the longer I've been, you know, I've been behind a camera now for almost 40, 40 years, 35, 40 years, something like that. And and the longer I do it, the more the technical stuff, the the actual, you know, the gear uh, gets out of the way, and the more able I am while having these experiences to process. What, and one of the things that's most important to me is juxtaposition. I love. Yeah love juxtaposition i believe especially with a single frame because photographer videographers can tell a story no problem they, they can do a narrative arc and but if but to tell a story in one frame is i would argue is almost impossible you can imply story and you mm -hmm. can use the elements of story uh but in a real you know in a movie story moves forward because of conflict in a still frame I, I believe that instead of conflict, it moves forward or is implied with contrast and specifically not tonal contrast or color contrast, but contrast of ideas, ancient versus modern or, you know, and, and it could be, you know, if you're more an abstract photographer, it could be juxtaposition or uh, contrast of shape or, or line or whatever. But 
um, yeah, I'm very much thinking about those things because that's because it fascinates me. It's not an, an academic thing. It may have started that way, but I just now I just when I see a juxtaposition because I've taught it yeah. so many times and I'm I was always looking for examples of it. Now I see an interesting juxtaposition. I'm like, oh my god, look at that! And that that is my trigger for picking up the camera. If I'm walking yeah. through a street in India and I think, oh my god, look at that, or I do a double take. Uh, and I've told my students, if I'm walking with them and we're talking and I say, oh, my God, look at that. I will give you one chance to photograph that thing. And and it can be all yours. But if you miss that chance, I'm picking up my camera and I'm going <laughs> after it because I'm I'm fat that. And I think as an artist, you need to know what fascinates you. You need to there's a whole world out there. You could make everything your subject. But I think there's an opportunity in being uh, in going deeper and focusing on fewer things. And really knowing what's you, and I love juxtaposition. Yeah. I just I think it's uh, it's just it's kind of one of those coincidental like this. It, I'm working. I'm writing a book right now called uh, Light, Space, and Time because I believe that photographs happen. The best photographs happen. Actually, all photographs happen at an intersection of light, space, and time. And the mm -hmm. more you can pursue that and think about it, uh, how am I using light? How am I using space? Uh, both in terms of where I am in space, what my lens is doing to that space, relationships within the frame, uh, and then time. You know, the camera can see time differently than we can. Um, I love shooting at slower shutter speeds, so everything kind of has a feel of blur to it. My work in Ethiopia, um, uh, there's an annual pilgrimage there that happens. And uh, one year I went, I just shot on the slowest possible shutter speed without it all being meaningless garbage. And the feeling of motion that I got from these throngs of people who were often kneeling down to pray or, you know, there was a press of people going into churches and, and that knowing that that's the thing you like, I think that's where voice comes from. It's knowing your preferences, knowing what works, ignoring all the other stuff that everyone else is doing and just focusing on the thing that you're like, oh my God, I am fascinated by this. Yeah. I'm fascinated by motion, by, you know, juxtaposition. If you can sort of figure that out, you know, and, and in my case, fascinated by the idea of encounter and intimacy, most of the portraits I make, they're not like long, you know, sneaky shots from, from a, I'm like right in there. I spend a week with some people. I'll go back every day on the streets of Varanasi. And if I find a fascinating person, no, the first time they might not say, yes, mm -hmm. I can photograph them. And I won't photograph without someone's consent. But by the time that I've been there for a week, they're like, who is this white guy that just keeps showing up every single day asking if I can, you know, eventually they're just like, oh, for the love of God, yes, just, just, yes. and, and, and by, and, you know, it said, you know, there's, there's some laughter. I use my poor Hindi on them. They laugh and just understanding why you're doing the thing you're doing. I like those encounters. I don't want a fly on the wall picture. I want a picture that makes you feel like you're there yeah. and, and want, even if you're never going to get to know that guy, you want to, and you're, you're curious, you know, um, some of the best photographs don't tell the whole story. They just kind of hint at it. And then they leave a bunch of it untold in the shadows because again, you know, we, one thing that photographers um, notoriously, no, conspicuously do not ask themselves is what, what do people respond to in a photograph? Like what's the risk? What, Cause we don't respond to images just because they are sharp or just because they're pictures of a bear. I've seen lots of, I've made lots of very poor pictures of bears that no one is going to respond to, but we respond to juxtaposition. It makes our brain kind of go, Hmm. You know, we respond yeah. to mystery. And if you can figure out not only what you are really interested in, but what, you know, what we respond to emotionally, I think there you have some, then you have some tools to work with. Then you've got, you know, the, the hint of a bit of a visual adventure ahead of you and that, okay, what happens if I do this? Okay, well, that didn't work. But what happens if I do this? Okay, well, I'm getting closer, you know, it's, and so that to go all the way back to the beginning, that's where creativity and adventure share, you know, they they share kind of common borders with each other. And that territory that they share is that uncertainty, right? It's And if you're willing to go down that road, either in terms of, is this going to work or isn't it, you know, um, or even just the internal stuff, like, am I up for the challenge? Have I got it in me? Well, maybe you don't right now, but maybe doing the work teaches you the things 
you need to know in order to be the artist that is going to create that work in a year, in two years, mm-hmm. in three years. We, we're so impatient with ourselves. You know, we're so impatient with our work. We're like, I want it's got to be done now. And you know, maybe the job of this piece, this body of work, this whatever, maybe it's not to be the thing. Maybe it's to be the thing that leads you to the thing. Yeah. And for that, you need some patience. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, very important to to be at peace with or find a way to to just be present and get that working as best you can. It's all going to play out, you know, but it, you can't get there unless you... I think we get derailed so easily, you know, if we're, we're, we're shooting sure. for something that we think we need or the outcome, but I've just really learned that, man, if, if, if I can just drop into what I'm making and feel, start that process going. And, and it's interesting because I can be, you know, in Varnasi, India, on a page in a sketchbook, the same quality, you know, of exploration and surprise and wonder that, oh my God, when this paint spills over into this area and we'll look what happens when I drag a pencil through it, you know, it's literally like this, it's still like traveling, you know, that's the, that's how, that's what, how I'm able to keep going. I don't know where I'm going to go, but I think uh, you know, just what your advice of just, you know, picking up the camera or just walking out the door and just start where you are. And that's, that's good enough, you know? Um, but I, I think it's, it's challenging, especially in the beginning, because there's, it's, it's evident that some people who have been making work for so long, you know, we compare ourselves and we think we're not qualified and all, all the things that come with that, with beginning, um, but the feeling of it again, how you can feel is the payoff, you know, where, how it brings you into the present, I, I think is, uh, is kind of the, the key to unlocking this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned challenge, you said it's, it's challenging and, uh, and it is, it's, it is. Uh, and I think that's part of the I think that's part of why some of us do it. Certainly, you know, that's the artistic version of why'd you climb the mountain? Because it was there. Um, but I think more than that, I think the fact that it is challenging is not a problem to be solved. It is not a, and it's certainly not an excuse not to do the work. The challenge is necessary. If, you, um, if you've read anything about flow, um, there was a sociologist, psychologist back in the 70s, 80s. He's still, to my knowledge, he's still writing. He's, his name is, get this, his name is uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He's, yes. uh, I, I believe he's Hungarian. Um, and he writes about flow and, and to distill it and do him a terrible injustice in doing so. He basically says you cannot have flow without challenge. It can't be too much challenge. If it's too much challenge, you just give up. If it's not enough challenge, you get bored. But without challenge, there is no flow. You will never get to that point where you're just doing the work and time passes and you're just yeah. so present that the work kind of when you step back, you go, I don't even know where that came from. Like I've written things and I've just, I get done and I go, I had no idea I even knew those things <laughs> and they just, woo, they just came out. And, and I think when you can, when you can look back and, you know, at a piece that you've made and go, I have no idea. I really, I can give all kinds of explanations, but the heart of it is don't really know where that came from. I was just doing the work and it emerged. That is, I mean, that's the payoff. I the feeling of yeah. just you suddenly you know something you didn't know before. You see a piece of yourself, and and you know maybe through life it's just a constant putting in an extra piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And it's not until we get to the end, if we have some time to reflect before we die, that we go, oh, so that's you know, so that's. Yeah who I am. That's what, so the challenge is important. We need it. It's not something like, Oh, I'll I'll do my art making when conditions are perfect. No, you won't. And no art has ever been made when conditions are perfect. You've got to do it now because conditions are not perfect because that will get you to flow. It will expose some raw part of yourself that you, you know, that is some blistering and something uncomfortable 
that's where it's going to be so good and so real. Yeah. So I, but we like ease, don't we? We like yeah. things to be comfortable and, and that's, that's toxic for creative people. You know, I think that flow is when we're being ourselves and, and we're, it's comfortable. It actually is such a, you know, we, I think we have all our faculties. We have the magical powers. We're just, nothing's in our way. And I think I've had that experience where I've made work that I can talk about afterwards, but I don't really understand. I mean, it was just, it was, I don't know how it was made. And it's just such a unfolding and, uh, but I think it's, I think we can get that with having the challenge, not too much. And, and, and it's just presence, you know, it's just being present. And I think that's why this is so gratifying. It's so satisfying to be making art or I imagine photographing under sea or wherever. It's just, you are so in the moment and that is, you're not worrying about anything. You're, you're just responding. You're like a human animal, just emotionally connecting. I and the voices that. and the voices are silent. All the voices yes. that tell you, yeah. you can't do it. All the concern that, you know, you're just a fraud or whatever. The voices for that time are quiet. And uh, I find that a very... Uh, Hard to get into flow is not easy to get into, yeah. but as you said, once you're in it, yeah, it's the most, it's, it's comfortable because it's natural. It's, it's where we should be most of the time. We are just being ourselves, but you got to break through this kind of crust to get there. And, uh, but when you're in it, as, as one of the reasons I love scuba diving, when you're, when you're at, you know, 30 feet or whatever, and you're interacting with a dolphin or something, um, even if you're not, you're just looking at a piece of seaweed. There's no voices. All you hear is your your breathing, yeah, just in yeah. and as very. I find diving when it's going well is very meditative. It's it's an extraordinary experience. Yeah, I, you know, I I remember a good friend of mine was became a photographer, and we were at art school at the same time, and and I've always taken photographs, and I. I love the idea of going out in the world and taking photographs. I mean, I, I kind of chose a different direction. And the reason I did is I was nervous or I found it harder to get into flow because of the, the technology, because of the equipment. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Like, I guess you just know it so well, but you, if you're scuba diving, you've got, you got to have lights, right? You got to have the camera, the shutter, all the things, you know, all the tools. Is it at a point where you, you are no longer aware of those, uh, of the devices, the, you know, hold, like holding up a camera in public is a thing, you know, like that's, and I like, I, you know, I just wonder how you, if, how you manage that or, yeah. yeah, it's 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 funny because I think a lot of photographers got into photography because they wanted some form of creative expression, um, but felt, you know, like it like it, this was going to be a shortcut because they didn't have the skill to, mm. you know, to to draw or paint or whatever. And they kind of got a, a bit of a raw deal because they didn't realize how much work it was going to be to truly actually uh, you know, figure out how not only how to use it, but use it for a purpose and then for it to become sort of intuitive. Um, unrelated to that, but your question about underwater, no, that is, it, it was the hardest thing that I have ever done creatively because you're not only worried about, you know, I thought, well, how hard can it be? I know how to use a camera. Well, the thing is you put your camera inside a housing, the buttons are in different places. Uh, the, yeah. the mechanics are all different. Muscle memory is just completely erased. And, and on top of that, you're trying to pay attention to your buoyancy. You want to make sure that you're maintaining, you know, buoyancy, you know, up and down. You're making sure that the thing that, you know, is going to bite you, stab you, poke you, you know, eat you uh, is where you think it is going, you know, should be. Um, it's And that you are not damaging anything. You're not hitting, bumping up against the coral. And so there's like, there is so much going on in your mind. Um, you'll notice that uh, almost all of my underwater stuff, at least on my website, is all black and white. Uh, yeah. That's because I, I don't want to photograph 
in part, I don't want to photograph with lights. And you need uh, lights to, uh, if you bring white light into the underground or underwater world, you bring the spectrum back. Um, otherwise, you just end up with green and blue. And the deeper you go yes. down, the, the less of the spectrum is available mm. to you. So you bring that white light in and all of a sudden it's just the world illuminated. Like it's just, it's crazy colorful down there. Um, but I, I like black and white for it. It had a very sort of... Um, I don't know, it maintained some of the mystery. And, yeah. uh, uh, but that was one of the reasons was I, I tried with this, the strobes and it, finally I just went, this is not a challenge. I, we always choose, well, we don't always, some of us have constraints we didn't choose, but we have an opportunity to choose some of the constraints with which we work. And I just decided, no, that wasn't, that was not it for me. And I love black and white to begin with. So I ditched the lights, uh, but no, it was really, truly yeah. And it still is. I, I'm, I'm not even remotely at the point where I feel um, on my way to mastery. I Certainly, I feel that way in terms of the image. And I know what makes a good image. Mm -hmm. and after mm -hmm. 35 years, I'm starting to feel like I'm, I might be, uh, I might have a chance at this. Um, but underwater with the technology, no, I'm a, I'm a mess. I'm a, I am yeah. just a hot mess. Uh, I can't it's hard. Imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, I've done a lot of diving. I was going to be a marine biology major and I did all these. Too. I've done a ton of scuba diving. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was so enthralled with what was going on down there that that I thought that I wanted to study it. But really, I was just visually, uh, you know, it, it drew me into art. It, you know, I decided to give up on the, the science part of it and realize, well, I'm just actually just so turned on visually uh, that I ended up going more into art. But yeah, I was, uh, I've done a, a lot of diving in different parts of the world. And, um, but I, it, it did, I just can't imagine getting those photographs and it, wow, you know, carrying all that housing with you and everything that's amazing. It's a mess. But, I hate it. And I, I didn't, I didn't even <laughs> realize that they were black and white. You know, it's funny. I, and maybe that's part of the, the feeling they have. I, I just didn't realize that they were black and white until you said that. So mm. it doesn't, it's okay. And I know that artificial color thing, that what it looks like for us down there without mm. the white light, it's, it just looks like bad color, you know? Yeah. So yeah. you would have to come down with huge lights and oh my God, I can't imagine. You know? It's, it's a, it's a science all its own. It's a craft that I, I have nothing but respect for, but at the end of the day, it's not one that I feel like I want to put the time into mastering. We all have to make our choices, right? And do I want to spend more time doing what I know I can accomplish and I'm good at and really enjoy more time in flow? Or do I want to spend more time banging my head against the anvil that is underwater lighting? Uh, no, life's kind of too short for that yeah. for me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm curious about you. You're an amazing writer and you, you know, your, you know, podcasting and, and your, your photography, how do you think of writing in terms of like, what are you carrying over from your photography? I mean, I know it's all a creative process and everything, but um, what have you learned from the writing that you apply to your photography or vice versa? Yeah, I don't, it's funny. I I'm not sure whether it is one or the other. Uh, well, it certainly is, but I don't know which. Um, he, here's, I think here's the big takeaway. When I started writing, uh, like really, I've been writing since I was a kid, but really like, you know, writing food mm -hmm. books and articles and that sort of thing uh, for others um, and for legacy. Uh, I hated rewriting. Oh my God, Nick. If if I wrote something, that was it. It was like, no, I've, oh, if it's not good enough for you, it's not, it's, but this is what I've written, hated it. And I have learned that creativity, um, often the best stuff comes in iterations and yeah. that my best writing, much as I, I'm getting less loathsome of it now, um, but also in my photography, I don't show up and take one photograph and go, well, there you go. I've done the work. 
I show up and I make photograph after photograph after photograph. And I refer to them as sketch images in part because a lot of people, photographers, especially they talk about keeper rates and, Oh, I made this many frames, but my keeper rate is this. And I mean, that is a terrible way to think about your art. That's just, that's just Do nonsense. You, a keeper rate is the number of, of wins as opposed to the bad shots that you, you get an actual computation. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah that's pretty, oh my God. Pretty, pretty much. And, and it's a, I, oh, the, the stories I could tell you about some of the nonsense that goes on in the photography world. And look, I'm part of the photography world. I'm not setting myself apart. Um, I just like to be the voice that goes, well, yeah, maybe we can think about this in a, in a healthier way. Um, I, I, but the sketches are really important to me. So if I'm doing a workshop in, say, Venice, uh, and I, sh I send my students out to do a project and I'll wander around and I'll see them and I'll be like, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, and and if they're like, oh, well, you know, not, not very well. And I'll say, oh, well, can I, you know, can I see what you shot? And they're like, well, first of all, that's agonizing for them because they think I'm looking for a good photograph. I'm not. If you tell me that it's not going very well and I look on your, the back of your camera and you have made six photographs and already decided that, that it's not working, uh... You're not risking. You're not trying. Yeah. I want to see 300 photographs, mm -hmm. not all from the same place. I want to see that you have circled the thing that interests you. I want to see that you've laid down on the ground or put your camera in the air or used a slow shutter. Or I, I want to see that you've worked it. And they're like, well, it's just not working. And I'm like, well, something's not working. It's not the scene. It's you. <laughs> and it's you're, not you're the just, camera. The camera is pretty good. <laughs> Cameras really, it would it would do amazing things if only you would try. And it's just it can't, again, it comes down to understanding creativity. And creativity is almost always iterative. A leads to yeah. B, leads to yeah. C, leads to oh my god. And oh my god may be way down the road, but you're never gonna get there until you go A, B, C, and just okay, little tweak. Okay, let's change that. Oh, that's working, but that's not. Let's change that. And that is, is what I have found in my rewriting. Uh, and it's what I find in my photography is iterations are not only, they're not only okay, they are necessary. And uh, there are, we should be very suspicious of our first efforts. You know, our first yeah. efforts are like the, yeah. and writers, <laughs> writers know this. Uh, more than photographers do. Photographers see it as, as something's, something's deficient in me if I can't get the shot. Whereas writers, they know that they got to write a shitty first draft. They just know it. They, they know they got to get the bones down. And writers have written about the process of writing, but there are very few photographers in the photography world that uh, write about the, uh, the process of photography because they're all off busy, you know, making photographs. And that's their medium, not writing. And so I'm sort of in a unique place where I can kind yeah. of straddle straddle the border and go, hey, you know, this, if we just paid attention yeah. to, if, you know, like I'm very interested yeah. in inter interdisciplinary stuff. So um, so that's, it, it's actually a really good question. I don't think I've really thought about it before yeah. like that. But. It crosses over. And, and I don't know if you find this, but this is what I've learned also, because you also teach workshops isn't it true this iteration of teaching where you you can land for somebody you can get someone to understand something you try all these different ways and then you learn a way to do it and then that works and then you build on that and you build on that and it's like oh man you know after you've taught for a number of years you you know how to to get someone to understand something you know i mean just the way you were describing the you know, let me look at the back of your camera and, you know, and see all this. Did you take it high? Did you take it low? You, could, you know, it's, 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 um, it applies to everything, you know, the, 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 this iteration. I, I just think it's a great way to go through life, actually, you know, we just, we get to just iterate and isn't this amazing? And I just hope I get to do this as long as possible. You know? Very much, very much. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. I think this sort of had the suspicion that the, the skills that make you a good, well, in you know my case, a, a photographer or writer, I think they're also the skills that make you good at life. You know, yeah. the ability to look at things from a different angle, the ability to not beat yourself up when it doesn't go right the first time, and to try again. Like the principles of, um, in fact, one of the books I, I wrote about creativity, a beautiful anarchy. Um, the subtitle was, you know, when the life creative becomes the life created. The fact that, you know, we, the life we make is our greatest piece of 
piece of art. It's, yeah. It is the thing that will be, we probably, most of us, let's face it, most of us are not going to leave our legacy in the, the paintings that we make, or in my case, the photographs. I'm hoping I'll leave some legacy with my, my writing, but um, but we will leave legacy with our with our lives for good or for bad. And it, it, the creative process, all the things that make us good creatives, if you can approach your making your life that way, I don't know. That to me is if you can live in flow, that's it for me. That's, yeah. you know, and that's where the gratitude comes from. Even when the challenge, you know, I've had a lot of people saying to me over the last couple of weeks because of the amputation and, you know, a lot of people saying, oh my God, it must be so hard. And I'm like, you know, yeah, or, or I'm sorry for the, I'm sorry for the struggles. And I'm like, why? I mean, I appreciate their empathy. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, But, yeah, but yeah. I'm like, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm thriving. I think we need a bit of a fight. And now if this thing goes, you know, septic and I am in the hospital and, and, yeah, you know, yeah. in a coma and die, well, right. uh, that's a different, that's a different thing, but I'm thriving. I mean, that's, again, that's the challenge, right? The challenge is, is enough to keep me in flow. It's not mm -hmm. so much that I've got sepsis and I'm dying. It's not so little that I'm bored. It's yeah. just enough that I'm like, I'm good. I'm, yeah. and that's, if you can live there, you can live with gratitude and, um, you know, everyone wants to be happy, but I think more important is that we have meaning and yeah, yeah, that's where I find it. Yeah, dude, that is so inspiring. And it's really, you know, the study of art and teaching it for me came, what is that? This life to art, you know, what, how we, how we process, how we, in the end, make our greatest piece of art is the life, you know, and what we're learning in our art making and how we're making that into a life. And it's just, uh, it's such a beautiful um, crossover, you know, it's just so applies. And uh, anyway, really inspiring, dude. Thank you so much for yeah. being here. And uh, you're welcome. Before we go, I just had a quick one last question. What's, I just always like to know at the end here, wh what is the, um, where are you, um, what are you most excited about and heading towards, uh, you know, your next project you're going on or, you know, the, the big one is the most personal one. And that's just walking again without crutches. Yeah. I, I'm very excited to get back into the world and, uh, you know, have these encounters. I've got a bear trip scheduled for end of September. There's a big salmon run that happens every year in the fall millions of sockeye salmon come, oh come you know, back to spawn. And, and once they spawn, they sort of die off. And so the grizzly bears come and, and I, I, you know, grizzly bears, bears in general are kind of my spirit animal and to go and spend time with, with these bears. I just, I, I love, I'm so looking forward to it and I'm quite sure I'll be up and up and walking by then. Uh, and then January, I, I uh, always spend um, January and or February in Kenya uh, leading safaris and just spending time with the big animals. And uh, wow. it's just, yeah. So those, those, and then I've, you know, I've got this book that I'm, that I'm sort of chipping away at and it's kind of a, it's called light space and time. And the, the subtitle is so far, this is the working subtitle is uh, essays on uh, creativity and camera craft or creative camera craft and creativity. Um, Cause I speak a lot about creativity. I mean, that's, that is kind of what I speak about. Um, mm -hmm. My, my podcast, a beautiful anarchy, the book that I wrote a beautiful anarchy um, and others. Uh, they're kind of general. I think this one is a return to photographers because photographers we're a little, we're a little kind of, Okay, I'm going to say it. we're kind of a little bit inbred, and, uh, <laughs> and 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 rather than you know going out and reading what writers are writing about writing or painters or photographers tend to be a little bit kind of like you know we're all a little bit nervous that we're the redheaded stepchild of the arts, um, and so I <laughs> I want to bring some of these conversations back in a way that you know to I, I want to trick some photographers into reading about creativity. Uh, rather than about, uh, you know, their gear and that sort of thing, which, which is, I've made a career on. And my mother said the other day, well, what's this one about? I said, well, it's about the same thing every one of my books has been about. It's, it's just helping photographers think like photographers, you know, and more creatively. And every one of them is kind of the same, but trying to, you know, <laughs> tackle it from a different angle. So, so that's, wow. that's kind of the next thing. Wow. Well, next group listen, of thank you so much. And uh, for, for you folks listening, um, there'll be all kinds of links in the show notes. Um, 
Did I hear that right? If someone wants to come on a safari with you, they can. It's it's a it's a photography safari. Are I, these I, workshops yeah, or are these you just certainly? Your own? Yeah, you know, I do. I, they're not workshops. They're more like a shared travel experience. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, certainly people could get in touch with me. Um, if if I'm being completely honest, the chances are pretty slim because I, uh, at this point, I only bring, you know, traveling with other people. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a gamble. Um, wow. And I have, so most of my trips now, I open first to my alumni that I've traveled with and, and have worked with and mentored uh, because that allows us a continuity of, you know, you know, kind of a continuity of care, yeah, yeah. but it also allows me, not that they're not all crazy, they are, but it allows me to control the kind of crazy that comes with me. Um, but yeah, we do, we, and every now and then there's a chance to come and, you know, photograph bears or, or come on safari. Um, I am now that COVID's over and we've all had a time, chance to breathe and, and re regroup. Uh, I will start restart my photography workshops in places like uh, Venice, Italy, India, that sort of sort of thing. And that that's a little bit more, a little bit more open. But uh, cool. the big chance to learn from me is is either my podcast. I think especially I haven't done my podcast for. I don't know, at least a year. And I don't know if I'll resume it, but there's 80 really, I, I yeah. think, uh, great episodes on yeah. A Beautiful Anarchy. And then there's, um, if you're interested in creativity instead of photography, um, uh, my books, A Beautiful Anarchy and Start Ugly are both available on Amazon. And, and I think, uh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't have written them if I didn't think they were important, but I, I think they're uh, particularly important for creatives who are looking to, uh, you know, examine the process a little bit more and, yeah. and bring some of their humanity to what they do. Fantastic. All right, David, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Boy, that was great, man. Yeah.